Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 12. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God, and to whom they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the sayings concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Thank you, Danny Moses, for the scripture reading, and uh, thank for the good singing led by Brother Philip this morning, and for the privilege to pray. Uh, we're thankful for our visitors today. We're so glad to have you, and we're thankful for all the children here. And you know, regarding the children, when you hear children here present or on recording, it's an encouragement because people know that. The children are there, so that's good. And so we're thankful for all, everyone here today, every person. Our lesson today is on preaching Christ. We just read about Philip, the evangelist, preaching Christ to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. Uh, before we begin, though, I do want to remind everyone of next Lord's Day, first Sunday of the month, as we do every first Sunday. Uh, we will eat together after the morning worship. Then at following that, around 12.45, we'll have our afternoon worship. And then we'll go to the nursing home for our worship there at 2 o'clock here in Mount Pleasant. So we want to remind everyone of that next Lord's Day. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Paul said that we don't preach ourselves. Sadly, there are some preachers that preach themselves. They preach their ideas, or they talk about themselves rather than preaching Christ. But yet, true preachers like Paul preach Christ. And we want to talk about what that means this morning. Preaching Christ Jesus the Lord. Preaching Christ is to preach the truth. The truth we have today recorded in the Bible. Before Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and went back to heaven, he promised the apostles that when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. He shall glorify me, Paul said there, or Jesus said in John 16 and verse number 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. The truth is the word of God. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So whenever the truth is preached, the word of God is preached. Whenever the truth is preached, Christ is preached. That's what it means to preach Christ, to preach the Word of God, to preach the truth. And moreover, from the words of Jesus here, we deduce that preaching the truth glorifies Christ. He glorifies Christ. But now let's consider that preaching Christ is a prominent theme of the New Testament. In Acts chapter 5, after the apostles were beaten, 
for preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus, they didn't stop. We read at the end of the chapter, verse number 42, and daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to preach, teach and preach Jesus Christ. They continued on. Then we go to Acts chapter 8 that we studied a while ago, verses 4 and 5. And they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Or as one version says, he preached unto them the Christ. So today we want to look at preaching Christ as a prominent theme in the New Testament. We want to look at what it means to preach Christ. And that preaching Christ means preaching the gospel plan of salvation. It means preaching the Lord's church, the kingdom of God. And it means preaching the name of Jesus Christ and salvation in His name. Now here are some other ways of describing the preaching of Christ. One is to preach the gospel. Jesus commanded His disciples in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. We learn of the power that's in the gospel in Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The word gospel translates the Greek word euangelion, which means glad or joyful tidings. And certainly we can see why the gospel is such good news and glad tidings. It tells man of a Savior and of God's love for him. It tells us how to become saved. It tells us of the many blessings that we have in Christ. It tells us of a heavenly home that we can reach if we will follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Another way of describing the preaching of Christ is the preaching of the Word, the preaching of the Word of God. The preaching of the word of the Lord. In Acts the 13th chapter, in verse number 5, we read of Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue to the Jews. And they had also John to their ministry. They preached the word of God. And again, Acts chapter 8, verse number 4, that we cited a while ago. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Paul charged Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, a charge that stands today for gospel preachers. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that is the living, and the dead, at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. So preaching the gospel, preaching the word, preaching the word of God, preaching the word of the Lord, Acts 15, verse 35 and 36, all refer to preaching Christ. But then also, preaching the cross. And preaching Christ crucified is preaching Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18, Paul said, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. In chapter 1, verse 23, also in 1 Corinthians, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are saved, but them that are called Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So preaching Christ crucified is to preach Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 and 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He was not saying there, the only thing I ever preach is about the crucifixion, although that's very important. We know that, that we must preach that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. If we preach the Gospel according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 4. But yet, what He's saying is that everything in the Gospel is centered around Christ and His great sacrifice, His crucifixion. 
That without that, we cannot be saved. That without Christ him crucified, there would be no gospel. So we've seen so far this morning that preaching Christ is to preach the gospel, is to preach the word of God, it is to preach the cross for Christ and him crucified. But then also there is something else that is to preach Christ. As we turn to the book of Luke in the last chapter, before Jesus ascended up to heaven after his resurrection, in Luke 24, verse 46 and 47, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So preaching repentance and remission of sins is to preach Christ. Remission of sin simply means the taking away or the removal of sin, the blotting out of sin. Acts 3.19 We know that Christ shed His blood for the remission of our sins. As we look, we'll observe the Lord's Supper here in a little while. Jesus said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26.28 So the same reason that Christ shed His blood is the reason that we are to be baptized. The fulfillment of the promise of Jesus in Luke 24, 47, that repentance and remission of his sin should be preached in his name was fulfilled in Acts 2. And of course, we know that it continued on after that, that even today we preach repentance and remission of sins in the name of the Lord. In Acts 2, 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were to be baptized to have their sins remitted or removed. We find a similar command in Acts 22 and verse 16. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Sins are washed away by the blood of Christ, according to Revelation 1, verse 5. And so when we submit to the Lord's command to be baptized, our sins are washed away, as the Bible teaches here. Moreover, preaching Christ and the resurrection. When the resurrection is preached, then Christ is preached. In Acts, the 17th chapter, verses 2 and 3, we read of Paul going into the synagogue at the city of Thessalonica, and his custom was to always go to the synagogue first, the synagogue of the Jews. And then when they turned him away or rejected him, he would go to the Gentiles. In Acts 17, verse 2 and 3, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them in three Sabbath days, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Opening and alleging, he set forth an argument from the Scriptures that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. This is central to the preaching of the gospel, to preach the resurrection of Jesus. We read in Acts chapter 4, the first two verses of a group of men who became very disturbed at the preaching of the resurrection. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Friends, how corrupted that is. The resurrection should bring great joy to man. Why, we've had loved ones to pass from this life. Family members, as our good brother Keith Sussman in England passed away suddenly thirsty, a good friend, 61 years old. We have people in our family, in the church, that pass away. Those who die in Christ. We have hope for them that they will be raised to eternal life one day. This is one of the great things of the gospel, is the hope of eternal life that we learn of when we hear the gospel of Christ. That when we die, it's not all over. Or that we don't have to be lost in eternal destruction that we can be saved, that we can be raised from the dead and go to heaven one day. 
Isn't this a wonderful thing? Isn't this great news? That's the gospel of Christ. That's involved in preaching Christ. We know, moreover, that preaching Christ is to preach the faith. We remember those who heard of Paul, who at one time was a great persecutor of the church, Saul of Tarsus. They heard that he now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Galatians 1 23. The faith refers to the body and totality of New Testament teaching. Now there's personal faith that we're all to have, which comes about by the hearing of God's word. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 17. But in the New Testament, often when we see the word faith preceded by the article the, it's not referring to personal faith. It's referring to the body of New Testament teaching. For example, we read of those who obeyed the faith in Acts 6-7 because they obeyed the gospel. We read that we are to continue in the faith, grounded and settled, Colossians 1-23. We are to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. That should prove without question that the faith is that which has been delivered unto man by God through inspired men. We are to contend earnestly for that according to Jude and verse number three. But now let's look at some more specific things about preaching Christ. Let's turn to Acts chapter eight that we read a while ago. As we look at preaching Christ, it means preaching the gospel plan of salvation. Perhaps you've heard before people say, well, give me the man, not the plan. Give me Jesus, but not the church. Give me the man, but not the plan. In order to preach the man, we must preach the plan. We know that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, 5. This is one of the great things, one of the great and deep things of God's Word, and that is the fact that Jesus Christ, He became a man, according to Philippians 2, 5, 8. And He went back to heaven. But all the time before He came to this earth, while he was on earth and after he went back to heaven, he was still God. He was still God. He was fully God and he is fully man. We know that he is called Emmanuel, God with us, Matthew 1, 23. Great is the mystery of godliness, the first thing that Paul said there in 1 Timothy 3, 16, that God was manifest in the flesh. John 1, 14, the Word became flesh, or was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But now let's look here at the preaching of Christ in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8 here, in verse number 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. He preached unto them the Christ. He preached the Messiah because that's what Christ means according to John chapter 1. He preached Christ unto them. Verse number 12, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. What is the reaction to people when they hear Christ preached? If they receive the word properly, they obey what they hear preached. So hearing Christ preach is not only hearing about Christ, who He is, the Son of God, John 20, 30, 31, Matthew 16, 16. His death, burial, and resurrection, it includes that, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And the many things He's done for us. But preaching Christ also entails preaching our responsibility and what we are to do. We know that in order to obey Christ and come into Him, we must hear and believe His Word, Romans 10, 17. We must repent, Acts 2, 38, as Peter commanded those on Pentecost Day in Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
It also is to confess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, 37, and then to be baptized in His name, Acts 2, 38, as we see here in Acts 8, 12. They were baptized when they believed Philip preaching Christ. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, verse number 16. We know here that when these Samaritans believed the preaching of Christ that Philip preached, they were baptized, both men and women. They were baptized. Now why would a person be baptized? Well, first of all, the Lord commands it. We know that it is a command of the Lord according to Acts 10, verse 48. As Peter commanded those of the house of Cornelius to be baptized, in the name of the Lord. It is a command of God. But moreover, we are baptized to be saved, like Jesus said, Mark 16, 16. We are baptized to have our sins remitted and washed away, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16. We are baptized in order to put on Christ. Let's ask this question. How many of the Galatians had put on Christ? Paul answers the question, Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Today, how many people have put on Christ? Answer with the same statement from God's Word. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, how many have put on Christ? Just as many as Paul said there, those who were baptized into Christ. In Romans 6, 30, verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. The significance of His death is that is where His blood was shed and He offered Himself for us. To be the happy recipients of the benefits of the death of Christ, we must be baptized into His death. That we might be washed in the blood of Christ. Now let's stay in Acts chapter 8 here, and let's go over to Acts 8. And we read of the Ethiopian eunuch, the nobleman, who was the treasurer of Candace, queen of Ethiopia. Here in Acts chapter 8, he was reading from Isaiah, what we know as chapter 53. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb dumb or speechless before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Verse 32 and 33. Of whom speaketh the prophet this, asked the eunuch, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, verse 35, and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down to the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. My friends, we could draw some logical conclusions from this reading here. In verse 35, Philip opened his mouth, began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, verse 36, they came into certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now what can we deduce from the scriptures from these two verses? We can logically conclude that preaching Jesus is to preach the plan of salvation, including baptism. Because after he preached Jesus for a while, and they came to water as they were going down the road in the chariot, the Ethiopian who heard Christ preach wanted to be baptized. What do we conclude from that? That preaching Christ includes preaching baptism. And what did the evangelist Philip tell him? If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He made the good confession. So we have seen today, for one thing, that we must hear and believe the gospel. 
This is why Jesus commanded us to go and preach the gospel. Secondly, well, secondly, we must believe, but then thirdly, we must repent, Acts 2, 38, and confess Jesus Christ, Son of God, as we read here in Acts 8, verse 37. Then we must go down into the water to be baptized, to have our sins washed away by the blood of Christ. Preaching Jesus led to the faith of the eunuch. It led the eunuch to confess Christ before men. It led the eunuch into the waters of baptism and then back up out of them again. He went down in sin and he came up in Christ because he obeyed the gospel plan of salvation. Preaching Christ, as we say here in Acts chapter 8, also means to preach the Lord's church. In Acts 8, verse number 12, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Someone might say, well, I don't see anything about the church there. Well, friends, a careful study of the New Testament will reveal to us that the Lord's church and His kingdom are the same. The gates of hell would not prevail against the church, Matthew 16, 18. The kingdom of God is a kingdom that cannot be moved, Hebrews 12, 28. A kingdom that will stand forever, the kingdom of God, according to Daniel 2, 44. Both began in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and they preached the gospel. For the first time, we read of the Lord's church being in existence, as the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved, verse 47. We read in the first chapter of Acts that the apostles would be baptized with the Holy Ghost, Acts 1 5. In verse 8, that they would receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost came upon them. And we also read that the kingdom of God would come with power, Mark 9, verse 1. It did come with power in Acts chapter 2. The kingdom of God came. We know that the kingdom of God and Christ's church are made up of the same people, the saints of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, saints are part of the church of God. In Colossae, the saints there, those in Christ, were a part of God's kingdom, the church. They had been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear son, Colossians 1, 13. They were a part of the body of Christ, the church, of which he is the head, Colossians 1, verse 18. We know that the Lord's church, the church of Christ, and the kingdom of God are entered at the same time and in the same way. Jesus said, Verily, verily, verily I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. When we submit to the teaching of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17, and we are buried in the waters of baptism like the Ethiopian unit was in Acts 8, 38 and 39. We enter into the kingdom of God. We enter into the church the same way. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. The one body of Christ, friends, is the church. But another point is that the same head is over the church as is over the kingdom. Christ is the king of kings. 1 Timothy 6, 15. As such, he has a kingdom. And that is the church. Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Ephesians 5, verse 23. But then last of all, preaching Christ means to preach the name of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Acts 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, there's the church, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. The name of Christ is the name that has all authority in it. Before giving the Great Commission, Jesus said, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. To do all in the name of the Lord Jesus means to do it by His authority, by his, according to His word. Colossians 3, 17, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And hence, when we preach Christ, we preach His name. We preach His authority. 
We preach the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, 27. We preach all the New Testament. We preach the doctrine of Christ. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. 2 John, verse 9. So today when we preach Christ, we preach His name. And we must understand what that means. What does it mean to do a thing in the name of Christ? Does that mean I raise my hand? Oh, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus Christ. I go out here on the street. I help somebody that's destitute. I'm doing this in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, I believe it's certainly authorized for us to help people in need. The Bible teaches that. However, friends, that's not all that's involved in doing something in the name of the Lord. To do something in His name means to do it according to His Word and by His authority. The Samaritans, evidently, they understood the authority principle of the Bible. That we only have the right and authority to do that which God has authorized. And we don't have the authority to do anything else. That's why we meet on the Lord's Day. We sing and pray and preach and teach. We give and we partake of the Lord's Supper. And we do so without mechanical instruments and music. Because we don't have authority for that. God has authorized us to sing and worship. Not to sing and play. Ephesians 5.19 Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing, make your melody in your heart to the Lord. And thus we don't have the authority to do other things musically in our worship in the Lord's church. Now if we were to go home and, and play a, a folk song on the guitar for our enjoyment, uh, you know, there's no sin in doing that. But when it comes to the worship of God, when it comes to sacred songs, we're not to use mechanical instruments for music. That's the same reason that we cannot have pancakes on the Lord's table. What they used in the Lord's Supper when Jesus ordained it and instituted in Luke 22 was unleavened bread because it was during the Passover. Luke 22, 1. And they were not to have any leaven in their houses during the Passover. And certainly they were not to partake of anything that had leaven in it. They used unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. As we close today, the Samaritan Christians understood the truth about the church. They understood the authority of Christ. And they understood the plan of salvation. They understood that salvation is only in the name of Jesus Christ, as Peter declared in Acts 4, verses 10 to 12, in that context. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And that, of course, is what we preach today. If we should have any here today who desire to do what these in Acts 8 did, we encourage you to do that. We will help you to learn more if that's your desire. We are to hear and believe God's Word, Romans 10, 17, to repent, Acts 2, 38, Confess Jesus Christ, Son of God, Acts 8, 37. To be baptized for the remission of sins in His name, Acts 2, 38. If we have done that as a child of God and we realize that we have gone astray, we need to come back to the Lord, we can repent and pray God's forgiveness and confess our sins and He promised to forgive us, Acts 8, 22, 1 John 1, 9. If this be your need, would you come while we stand with Him? Yes.